Yes, I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to this audience about a pure, a very old, a pure hobby project of mine. And uh, thanks go particularly to Carsten and to um, Gerald to basically for encouraging me to do this. Um, so, oops, there we go. So, why would I want to write a C compiler on the Commodore 64 in 1989? Uh, the machine was already on its decline at that point. Nowadays, the whole talk of obviously is uh, fully in the realm of retro computing. And the simple and um, most important answer, obviously, is I thought I could do it. So um, I did have a relatively long standing interest in compiler. I'm not even quite sure where it came from. Started in high school without even knowing anything. Two big sources of inspiration that I had back then was the um, small c compiler for 8080 processors by Ron Kane and James Hendricks, first published in Dr. Dobbs' journal and uh, then in this uh, book that I got hold of, which contains the entire source code, including assembler and library and optimizer and a fair number of other things. And then, of course, uh, there was the, the Dragon book. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, from that, I got the certain level of confidence. Yes, I could do something like that too. There was also the fact that I felt a certain level of opportunity that compilers that for the Commodore that I had access to at that time felt relatively sl slow and unpractical. Um, Sieve of Erafostenus was 33 to 35 times the runtime of pure assembler. Um, so it felt nice as a sort of exercise playground, but not really good for something practical. The next thing I did was uh, I had this Mercedes of Commodore 64 assemblers uh, back then, ACM. Alas, I don't know where Dirk Zabel uh, and this thing has gone, it really deserves attention. The cool thing it had was you could do string manipulation in the parameters of a macro expansion. And with that and conditional assembly, you actually could get a lot of mileage towards a proper language. So semantically, what I produced then, I called it S65+. Plus. S65 was a small macro library that came with the assembler. Uh, something that had functions and local and global variables, recursion, arrays, pointers, one level of pointers. And you could write something like the code that you see on the right here, which I actually find not too shabby, still still find not too shabby for, a, for an assembler. So um, you're grabbing your parameters here. Um, you can do a pretty decent while loop. Um, you can re return stuff. Um, but syntax-wise, this was still assembly-ish, and the goal from there on was, of course, to write a proper compiler. And actually, the code that you're looking at right now is part of the symbol table for the prospective next level of compiler that, are, that I wrote in this uh, macro language. But no, click doesn't work it because I write. What I then found is assembling this stuff became excruciatingly slow. And it turned out what I had written was a, hundred fact, a factor of 100 expansion of macro lines. So this was something like a poor compiler written in a comparatively slow interpreter. So off to the next or to a better implementation language, started to search. And then I encountered Ultraforth. I'm not even sure anymore whether it was in the 64 or in the CT magazine. It must have been in one of the two. Uh, this would have been in, 90, in 89. And I really liked it. So the, the biggest thing I liked about it uh, is the compact code. I was, even, even at the stage before, worried 
that the 64K of memory would be full before I was maybe even half through with, with the compiler. Um, it was fast enough. So instead of factor 33, it was just a factor of eight. And as I dug deeper into the sort of mindset, uh, it happened what I guess happened to everybody else in this room. I got really fascinated by the, by the concepts. And yes, then there was, of course, Leo Brody. So the, the overall reason why I wrote it in fourth is just the usual advantage, advantages of the language. Uh, nothing very particular to compilers yet. To talk a bit about the architecture at which I arrived, um, I sketched out here what I consider the, the typical architecture of a classical C compiler. You've got your source, it goes through a preprocessor, the expanded source goes into a scanner, which turns it into tokens, goes into the parser, which produces an abstract syntax tree, either explicitly or implicitly, which goes into the code generator, producing assembly, goes into an optimizer, producing assembly again, assembler turns it into object code, and the linker produces the executable. This is actually what uh, both uh, the small C compiler, but also, for example, the um, microware OS 968K compiler that I had worked on before starting to study uh, looked like. So to make things manageable for me, because there was, for example, no object code, no linker on the Commodore, I slashed this down a fair deal for my project. So there's no preprocessor. Defines are implemented as compiler constants. Um, include it's just a simple uh, routine in the input. Scanner is there. Parser is there. There's no explicit uh, abstract, so abstract syntax tree. The parser directly calls the code generator. And the code generator directly produces pretty much executable code. It just, in the end, needs to be merged with a fixed runtime module, and forward references need to be patched. The model, sort of usage model that I had in mind was something like Turbo Pascal 3. So single, pretty much a single pass compiler with a runtime module. Uh, one thing that I did build in, if the um, code that you compile doesn't have a main function, then the linker will actually produce a new runtime module that you can then build further <clears throat> compiles on top of. CC64's parser. Uh, parsers come in a number of ways or flavors, top down versus bottom up, um, handwritten versus generated. For the purpose of this presentation, I actually looked at the Wikipedia list of parser generators, was amazed how many there are. I knew there were many, but there are even more. Uh, in that list, there isn't a single one that produces fourth. However, I did find that we uh, in our audience have two people who have a fourth generating parser generator to their name. That's Anton and Brad. So, hat tip. Of course, I didn't know of that back then. So, the parser that CC64 has is a top down recursive descent parser. Um, advantage for me, easy to understand. Understanding a bottom up parsing algorithm is still one of my sort of pending ambitions for the future. Disadvantage is it needs a deep return stack because you go through all the levels of the of the grammar in subroutine calls. So that's the, the descent part. And whenever the grammar uh, points up again, for example, at opening parentheses, uh, then comes the recursion into play. And it's hand handcrafted. Uh, one of the reasons for that is definitely I find parser writing is fun. So that was why I spent the better part of the project on, I would say. Language limitations, um, it's Kerning and Ritchie, especially in the uh, function definition that's still somewhat painful. It has int and char only, only one level of point pointers again. I think those limitations I uh, picked up from uh, small c. 
No insights, no uh, unsigned, no floats, no structs, no unions, no type deaths, nothing. Just hint and char. But yeah, this is this is one example um, what the what the parser looks like. Uh, these are the two words that handle the logic and and or operators, and uh, the or first goes down to the end gets a value, sees is there an operator that I'm uh, responsible for coming, if so, call the code generator, call and again, call the, uh, the code generator again, oops, and repeat. And this goes, of, of course, all the way down. And of course, in real code, uh, the order of this is uh, the other way around. So from low level to, to higher level up. And um, we only have we have two calls into the code generator here because uh, the logic operators have this shortcut. If the first operand already determines the result, then the second one doesn't get uh, evaluated. For all other operators, you don't need this first one here. You just need one call into uh, into the code generator, which essentially uh, does an add on the on the virtual stack machine to which this is all compiled. And this, of course, is a golden opportunity for a defining word. Uh, this is what the, again, uh, order reverse, but this is what the, the um, operator hierarchy for the binary operators looks like. You descend from exclusive, exclusive or, um, no, the one on the back here is the, the defined operator. And here you see the, the descent through the, through the levels. On some levels, you have several uh, operators. These, these here are the symbols for the tokens. Do something is the corresponding code generator uh, method. And these here, the multiplication and division ones we're going to look at in a minute. But before that, one of the challenges for the whole thing was the processor on which I was sitting. Only three registers, all 8-bit an 8-bit hardware stack pointer, all not too friendly to a high-level language. And the approach that I arrived at uh, to sort of work around or beyond that uh, is I kind of defined a virtual 16-bit stack machine, the 16-bit accumulator in A and X, and all defined through these kind of um, code templates um, so, 16 bit ACU is um, loading low byte into, of a constant low byte into, into A and high byte into X, etc. For, um, uh, for expressions, I'm using the hardware stack. For local variables, uh, I'm using a software stack. And obviously, I need a few zero page addresses to. Uh, to work. This here is the definition of the code generator for um, for the divide and multiply operands. The biggest thing that this one here does is it handles um, constant and non-constant uh, operands. So the first one is just the fourth division. Then one call into the yeah it's I kind of think of it as the virtual assembler. Uh, dividing a constant by a. This one will be dividing a by a constant and dividing top of stack by next on stack. Uh, for the multiplication, obviously, the order doesn't matter, so you just have one of these. And it's implemented with a, a division subroutine. And uh, um, either storing a constant value into the zero page uh, uh, value, which the, the subroutine uses as the divisor, or storing the top of stack into that divisor and um, loading loading the value, the, loading the, the, the constant value into the ACU. And um, the mods are just the same, only that they uh, pick the remainder from the zero page address where 
the divide routine leave stuff. And then for these for these codes templates, which actually make these um, virtual virtual machine instructions, this is where I found that fourth really really shown. Um, is it shined? I don't know. Um, because you could, um, I could use the, the 6502 assembler just in line in the code to assemble these short uh, templates. Uh, obviously, it's a great pleasure to share this with the author of said assembler, Bill. Again, a hat. And uh, one little kind of uh, property of the machine. Uh, namely that all opcodes with uh, seven lower middle aren't used, allowed me to <clears throat> use uh, values with seven lower middle as placeholders for, a, uh, for templating. And that is what, what this word here, here, here does. It uh, basically sees, is it just a, an, uh, an opcode byte? Then it um, drops it into the uh, into the binary code, and if not, it goes to a, uh, to a table, which picks up potentially picks up a parameter, and then with these two words here, you can define either having a parameter or not having a parameter. Then you place a zero uh, in its place, a little loop which goes over one of these. Um, uh, over one of these templates and really produces already for a fixed address but produces um, executable code. So some other challenges that I faced during the development memory size. Um, I was worried about that uh, the com uh, compact code code of fourth basically saved me there I suspect. Keeping overview of the source code wasn't too easy. I had three disks with uh, 170 kilobytes, so the old 1541 uh, disks. Two of them uh, held the compiler, the third one held the editor. I did make a fair number of printouts with uh, 12 screens per page. I was able to read that back then, yet I couldn't today anymore. Um, moving screens around because I had to insert some more code where I didn't anticipate having to insert something uh, or because the next module sort of blocked space for expanding one module uh, did turn into a bit of a pain. The computer doesn't have a char set which supports, um, no, let's put it the other way around. There are a few important characters needed for C that the uh, char set doesn't support, doesn't have, so I had to provide those. There wasn't a text editor, default one, so I had to write one. And then testing turned out really, really hard um, on the on the real platform. I did get, so we're in 94, 95 now. The main development was uh, in parallel to, the, to my studies uh, semester three to six, so 89 to 91. Um, and uh, I did get a few really bad bugs fixed. For example, the division was uh, inverted. And then graduation, graduation happened and entering the work, workforce happened and my Commodore 64 died and then came a long pause. And last year in summer, I got approached through Facebook from someone, hey, are you the original author of, of, of CC64? I had uploaded it in uh, two versions to uh, CCNGA at U Waterloo, and it had survived from there. And that motivated me to pick the thing up again. Was sort of one of one of those long-standing ambitions. You have it almost ready, but well, I guess you can figure out figure uh, what that felt like. And what I did then, the first thing was move from, from screen sources to streams, uh, build some tooling uh, around the uh, ASCII PET scheme, uh, the Commodore char set um, 
transition, I wrote a very simple, very crude include implementation for Ultra 4, so Volks 4 now. I moved to, uh, to the Vice emulator. There, yay, I could have four disk drives, one for files and three for fourth blocks. Um, spent a lot of time, I guess that's my five minutes warning. Um, a lot of time automating stuff, scripting Vice with uh, feeding stuff into the key buff. How, then how does one terminate an, uh, an emulator from inside? Turned out the easiest way was through the file system. Uh, I read a fair amount of GNU make manual again, wrote tests and more tests, and then another test. Actually found some of the some of the bugs that uh, have been reported since then and a few others, and eventually was able to actually release the thing on GitHub. What came next was what I find a nice cross-pollination towards Volksforth. <clears throat> so that's when I joined Carsten in the in the renovation effort uh, of the of the code base. Uh, I ported the Vice automation infra. So for now, I'm just uh, involved in the in the Commodore uh, flavor of it. Uh, ported my crude include. Started to get with a little shim in between and some exclusions, but uh, some of the ANSI tests to work, got the target compile automated, and uh, the include then went into the core. And we have flavors now with and without the block words. Uh, that was in part driven by me wanting a little smaller CC64 uh, without that bit of the code that I really didn't need. Um, as a side note, I got the Commodore 16 flavor for 60, 30, 32K fixed, which was broken. And taking those binaries back to uh, CC64 then led to the next platform. Now we have a C compiler running on the plus four, which kind of pleased me. Further ideas port the thing to the commander x16, which is a current um, 65 CO2 uh, retro computer project going on. Would be nice to port the thing to Linux as a host. Then would be really nice to get some tests beyond the end-to-end -end tests that I have at the moment. So uh, test the the modules in separation a bit more. Don't have any of that yet. I really have to get ANSI uh, function headers in there. I would like to do some profiling. I find the thing is much slower than I think it needs to be, but I'm not very sure, or, or no, I'm rather very unsure why. Uh, would be nice to output assembler source. Would be nice to um, dabble into a relocating linker format and the linker. And then I still don't have anything resembling a, a C library. And with that, I would thank you all for your attention. And uh, are there any questions? Andrew. Uh, well, Philip, that, that was amazing. And I'm one of those people, I never thought I'd meet the author of, of CC64. So um, when, when, I, when I saw that you were coming after me and I would still be awake, it's not yet my bedtime, I was tremendously excited. So thank you very much for that. Um, so th this question, I'm going to sort of tease you, tease you a little bit with this question. Having finished, did you go on and write any applications in C for the Commodore 64, or did you prefer to write things in fourth anyway? I'm sorry, I didn't get the your audio broke up in the first half of your question. Oh, oh I'm sorry. When, when you finished it back in uh, 1989, did you go on and write any applications no. in C? Or no, do you not... prefer to do things in fourth anyway? I don't know. I probably would prefer to do things in fourth. 
um, I didn't get it to the point where I could actually have used it. So uh, um, if I had if I had to do the whole thing over again, I would probably find the option of uh, self-hosting a language attractive enough that I might go for that. But then again, code size. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> OK, Gerald. Uh, I was having a question about Commander 16. I'm also following this. Are you also in contact with getting your uh, some of your stuff into the into their core kit? You know, I think they wanted to have a um, a disk which includes some tools. And Dave was asked, or David was asking for some input. Did you try to get in contact? Not yet. Not yet. The the uh, my my Commander 16 effort is, I think, all of one week old. Ah. And. Uh, <laughs> Um, when I have something, I definitely will, will get in touch with him, yes. Carsten, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yes, hi, Philip. Um, one of your goals when you started out was uh, um, to, because or one of the motivations was the existing compilers were slow. How does CC64 compare with like Kai and Pascal? I frankly don't have an idea yet. So. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I was I was thinking whether I, whether I should should cut out the time somewhere to to write the C uh, in uh, in C again. I actually somewhere lost my uh, data data C implementation. Uh, I will say that uh, one of the motivations to pick it up again last uh, last year. So that's this guy in Australia. Um, I've lost contact to him at the moment, but uh, he started to actually write a C library. So if you go to CC64 on SourceForge, uh, you will find that that effort. And he claims uh, that CC64 is faster than CC65 and I think Super C. So he compared three uh, three compilers on the on the platform, and apparently in his in his test, I'm doing I'm doing very well. Um, I yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Brad Rodriguez has said that uh, it might be a good idea to post this into the 6502 group at 6502.org. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Brad. I'll very, very happily do that. Anyone we, else? Um, yeah, maybe just uh, a remark Ulrich? more than a question. Yep. Uh, uh, following the retro computing the uh, black space. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to learn that Volksforce is still being used. After all, I'm the author and I still uh, think happily back to the time where the entire force system was completely understandable. And now we live in GeForce times, which is difficult to mess with. Okay. Thank you, Klaus. Berlick? Yeah. Um, there's definitely need for development tools for retro computing. Uh, uh, as I follow up the, the scene, that there are even games development taking place uh, so that will run on the old hardware. And so uh, if uh, there's uh, development tools for the old machines, people will pick it up and do nice things for it. It's hobbyist, but uh, still worth doing. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening again. Last call. Uh, thank you, Philip. Right. Next up, 